Woodruff on the News Hour tonight, a clearer timeline. New reporting reveals the extent of Rudy Giuliani's business in Ukraine. And more confirmation that President Trump knew of a government whistleblower's complaint before releasing military aid. Then, injured on the job at Amazon and hidden from view, the human cost of convenience at one of the world's largest companies. Plus, waste not, shocking amounts of food never make it to the table and head straight for the landfill. But states like California are working to change that cycle. There's definitely enough food in Los Angeles and in local food systems that we are definitely able to feed everyone in Southern California. The issue is not necessarily with the food being available, it's a distribution problem. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. Major funding for the PBS NewsHour has been provided by BNSF Railway, Consumer Cellular, supporting social entrepreneurs and their solutions to the world's most pressing problems. SchoolFoundation.org. The Lemelson Foundation, committed to improving lives through invention in the U.S. and developing countries. On the web at lemelson.org. Supported by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. And with the ongoing support of these institutions. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening from NewsHour West. I'm Stephanie Sai. We'll return to Judy Woodruff and the rest of the show right after the latest headlines. Late this evening, President Trump signed into law two bills backing pro-democracy protesters in Hong Kong. The move puts Hong Kong's special trading status with the U.S. on the line, requiring an annual certification by the State Department. It also threatens sanctions for certain human rights abuses and bans the export of tear gas and other crowd control munitions to the Hong Kong police. Strong reaction came out of Beijing's foreign ministry Thursday morning, condemning U.S. efforts to interfere in Hong Kong and saying it will take firm countermeasures if the U.S. continues on this track. Former U.S. Navy Secretary Richard Spencer speaks out three days after being fired. He was in a dispute with President Trump over how to handle a Navy SEAL convicted of posing with a corpse in Iraq. In an opinion piece for The Washington Post, Spencer wrote, The president has very little understanding of what it means to be in the military, to fight ethically, or to be governed by a uniform set of rules and practices. A major storm dumped heavy snow across the Midwest today, fouling travel on the day before Thanksgiving. As much as a foot fell in some places, delaying flights at Chicago's O'Hare Airport, one of the nation's busiest. A separate system slammed Oregon and California with rain, snow and high wind. And transportation officials scrambled to keep the roads clear. We ran into some fog a little earlier. We're uh, reduced the visibility substantially. Snow's coming down and it's sticking. Uh, Caltrans is out in full force. They're sanding, they're plowing, they laid a brine solution down last night. We are going to try to keep it open. We are. That's our goal is to keep it open and keep it safe. Utility crews in California and Oregon also worked today to restore power to thousands. Explosions at a chemical plant in Texas have forced thousands of people from their homes tonight. The first blast hit the TPC plant at Port Natchez, 80 miles east of Houston, before dawn. A second explosion erupted this afternoon. It sent new fires racing through the site and new clouds of smoke high overhead. There were no deaths, but 60,000 people within four miles of the plant were ordered to evacuate. President Trump's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, is facing new questions about financial dealings in Ukraine amid the impeachment inquiry. The New York Times and The Washington Post report Giuliani pursued contracts with Ukrainian officials as he was pushing them to investigate Mr. Trump's political rivals. We'll take a closer look after the news summary. 
In Iraq, security forces have killed six more protesters and wounded 35 amid new unrest over corruption and economic distress. In Baghdad, crowds threw rocks over a barricade today, braving live fire and tear gas. Later, protesters burned the Iranian consulate in Najaf in a show of opposition to Iran's influence in Iraqi affairs. Officials in Iran now say 200,000 people took part in protests over gas prices last week, and 7,000 were arrested in a crackdown. Also today, the government reported nearly 900 banks, gas stations, and official buildings were burned out during rioting. In what is a common refrain, Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei told supporters that it was all fomented by the United States. It was a deep, extensive, and very dangerous conspiracy that cost the U.S. so much money and effort. They thought that they had found the opportunity and brought their troops to the field. This move was destroyed by the people. Amnesty International says more than 140 protesters were killed in the crackdown. Iran has not reported any number of its own. Violence surged overnight in Lebanon and dozens of people were hurt. Riot troops were called out in Tripoli as supporters and opponents of the country's president fought each other. The clashes left buildings damaged and fires burning. Protests against the country's political elite began in mid-October. And in Colombia, several thousand demonstrators marched in Bogota again today over economic conditions and a variety of other causes. The peaceful gathering came after nearly a week of sometimes violent protests. Four people have been killed and millions of dollars in business have been lost. Back in this country, the White House says it will defend making immigrant visas contingent on proof of health insurance. A federal judge temporarily blocked the policy on Tuesday. Opponents argue it would bar nearly two-thirds of all prospective legal immigrants. Meanwhile, immigration agents have arrested some 250 foreign students who enrolled in a fake university outside Detroit. It was part of a sting operation against visa fraud. Massachusetts today became the first state to ban flavored tobacco and e-cigarette products. Most of its provisions take effect immediately. Republican Governor Charlie Baker signed the bill at a ceremony in Boston, and he urged more action from the federal government. A national policy with respect to this stuff um, obviously can be far more effective than doing this one state at a time. But I cannot understand why anybody would think, given all the data and all the evidence, all the information that's out there at this point in time, that the right thing for us to do would be nothing. President Trump has proposed banning most flavors of e-cigarettes nationwide, but has not yet taken any concrete action. At least six companies that make or distribute prescription opioid painkillers are facing a federal criminal investigation. The Wall Street Journal and others report the focus is their role in the epidemic of opioid addiction and overdoses. And the companies include Amnil, Johnson & Johnson, Malacrot, and Teva, Amerisource, Bergen, and McKesson. Former President Jimmy Carter was released from a hospital in Atlanta today to head home for Thanksgiving. He had surgery two weeks ago to relieve pressure on his brain caused by bleeding from a recent fall. Mr. Carter is 95 years old. And former Deputy Attorney General William Ruckelshaus has died. He gained fame in 1973 when he refused to fire the Watergate special prosecutor as President Nixon had ordered and resigned his post instead. He was also the first head of the Environmental Protection Agency. William Ruckelshaus was 87 years old. Still to come on the News Hour with Judy Woodruff, the White House's pressure on Ukraine grows clear, and we check in to see how impeachment is resonating around the country. Hidden costs of two-day shipping, the dangerous conditions faced by Amazon's warehouse workers, reversing mammoth amounts of food waste in Southern California, and much more. This is the PBS NewsHour from WETA Studios in Washington and in the West from the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University. Another day, another new handful of revelations filling in our understanding of how President Trump, his associates, and his administration have been interacting with Ukraine. What was President Trump's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, doing in that Eastern European country? What did the president know about the government whistleblower complaint, and when did he know it? 
here with me to walk through yet another day of developments is our White House correspondent, Yamish Alcindor. So hello, Yamish. Hi. Much to follow, as always. So we did learn more today about Rudy Giuliani's involvement, dealings in Ukraine. What are we learning? The key thing is that people often say you need to follow the money. And in this case, both the Washington Post and the New York Times say they followed Rudy Giuliani's money to, to show that he was trying to really negotiate a lucrative consulting deal with the with the government of Ukraine while he was at the same time urging the top prosecutor there to look into Joe Biden and Hunter Biden. So what we know is that through documents, Rudy Giuliani was negotiating up to at least $200,000 to be paid by the Ukrainian government to do work that would have essentially been him looking into whether or not Ukraine had stolen money that somehow then ended up overseas. Rudy Giuliani says that he looked at this deal, he, that he agrees that this was something that he was looking into, but he says that ultimately he said, this was a conflict of interest. I thought it would look bad, and I never made a penny off of this. Why this is important is because what we see is Rudy Giuliani pressuring, essentially, or making Ukrainian officials look into this claim that Joe Biden might have been a corrupt person right. operating in their country at the same time as he's actually trying to benefit financially from this. So this is a very, very big deal and something that people are going to continue to look into. And it, and it raises questions again, Yamish, about the relationship between Rudy Giuliani and the president. He's the president's personal lawyer. Lawyer, but what's happening in their relationship? Well, it's very interesting because the other thing to note is that this could be breaking the law. If Rudy Giuliani was operating in this way in Ukraine, he could actually have been looking into um, possibly not, have for not registering as a foreign agent here, and that is breaking the law because you would be essentially f seeking to influence the United States government on the behalf of a foreign country. The other thing to note is that President Trump was answering questions about this, um, about whether or not he told Rudy Giuliani to do anything in Ukraine. Um, and here's what he told Bill Riley. Bill O'Reilly, he's the former Fox News host. Well, you have to ask that to Rudy, but Rudy, I don't, I don't even know. If, I know he was going to go to Ukraine, and I think he canceled the trip. Uh, but, you know, Rudy has other clients other than me. Yeah. I didn't direct him, but he, 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 is a, he is a warrior. Rudy's a warrior. Rudy went. He possibly saw some. But you have to understand, Rudy has other people that he represents. No, I know. Some people see this as the president trying to put some distance between himself and his personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, even though a number of officials have said that President Trump leaned on Rudy Giuliani to try to pressure Ukraine for this money. The other thing to note is that Rudy Giuliani at one point said that he had insurance on President Trump right. in case he tried to throw him under the bus. But he has since said that this was him being sarcastic. His lawyer, though, has said that he told Rudy Giuliani to call the president to reassure him that he was not trying to say anything that would upset their relationship. But I want to read a quote to you from Rudy Giuliani because he's really trying to make sure that he's defending the president and in the president's good graces. He tweeted today, reality check, Democrats have now issued more subpoenas than they have had bills signed into law. Their focus is not on bettering the lives of everyday Americans. It's about protecting their seats and remaining in power. And that, Judy, is really Rudy Giuliani echoing the president's complaints about this. Yeah, so much, uh, to, so much interesting there to follow. But uh, Yamish, separately, there was some reporting today about when President Trump learned of that government whistleblower's complaint. And, and what do we know about that? We long knew that White House officials were facing pressure from Congress and from reporters to release this $391 million in military aid to Ukraine. What we now know, based on the reporting by The New York Times, is that the president was briefed on the, on the whistleblower's complaint some two weeks before that military aid was released. And why that's really important is because the president told the EU ambassador, the European Union ambassador, Gordon Sondland, that he didn't want any sort of quid pro quo when they were talking before the money was released. And this timeline essentially shows that the president said this after he knew that there was a whistleblower complaint that was talking specifically about a quid pro quo. The other thing to note is that the White House has really had this defense that everything was okay because Ukraine got the money and the presidents of Ukraine and the United States eventually met. What we know now is that that aid, again, was released because the president knew about, or at least was in part because the president knew about the whistleblower complaint. The other thing to note is the White House meeting never actually happened. The two presidents met on the sidelines of the, year of the United Nations, but the president of Ukraine has yet to ever come to the White House and get what would really be a very diplomatic and big welcoming at the White House. That's much different than a sideline meeting. Coveted invitation. Yes. Thank you, Yamish. Thanks.
Here in the nation's capital, pretty much all the attention is on impeachment. But how is it being received in other parts of the country? We turn to three public media reporters to find out. Katie Swatolsky is with WLRN. It is South Florida's public radio station. Mary LaHammer of Twin Cities PBS in Minneapolis. And Benta Berkland of Colorado Public Radio. Benta joins us from Minneapolis as well, where she is visiting for the holidays. So hello to all three of you. It's great to have you with us on the news hour. Benta, I'm going to start with you. I know your home is Colorado, and that's what I want to talk about. When you talk to Colorado voters about what's going on with impeachment, what do they say? How much attention are they paying? Are they interested in it? When we talk to voters across the political spectrum, I was surprised how engaged people are and how much they're paying attention. A lot of people said they were going to watch the public hearings live. Other people were planning to follow it very closely in the news, and people had a lot of opinions but also understood the nuance and were just very, very closely paying attention. And Mary LaHammer, uh, what about you? I mean, your beat is Minnesota, the Twin Cities. Uh, are people, uh, are they following these hearings? Absolutely. Minnesotans are always incredibly engaged in politics. You know, we lead the nation in voter turnout, and we're also politically divided. We have one of, if not the only, divided legislature in the nation, and we're divided on impeachment, too. The latest polls show a, not a majority for or against it. So Minnesotans tend to run independent. We have a libertarian streak. We know President Trump came close to winning Minnesota just a percentage point and a half away. He visited here last month. He wants to be in contention. But those same polls are showing that as much as a t 10 points down on the presidential race it may have a factor that we do have a Minnesotan in the race in Senator Amy Klobuchar. You surely do. So Katie Swatolsky, President Trump, came to South Florida last night for a political rally. You were there. You went to the rally. And before I turn to you, I want to play for viewers just a bit of what the president had to say about the Democrats who are running this impeachment process. They're pushing that impeachment witch hunt, and a lot of bad things are happening to them. Because you see what's happening in the polls? Everybody said, that's really bull yeah. So, Katie, uh, clearly a very pro-Trump crowd. They appeared not to think much of the impeachment process. But what did they tell you? So, I think one of the interesting parts is the, the Trump supporters that are really worried about impeachment are worried about it from the perspective that their vote could potentially be suppressed or taken away from the 2016 election, um, which was a really interesting perspective I hadn't heard before. But last night, by and large, people are aligning impeachment um, just like they are from the Stormy Daniels scandal or the Mueller report. They're kind of thinking that this is one other thing, something new, but that's going to blow up or blow over soon. And what about uh, staying with you, uh, Katie? What about voters you talked to before this rally? I mean, you've been interviewing voters over a number of days. What it, what's everybody? What is everybody else telling you? Well, so last night there was a huge group of 19 to 20,000 Trump supporters in Broward County, which is a very, very blue Democratic county ahead of this rally. But there was also a counter Democratic protest. So I think South Floridians are worried about a couple of things here, but they are engaged in the impeachment process. And one of the interesting things is if they're not watching it live, they have been seriously following news recaps at the end of the day to make sure that they at least know the gist. I've had a lot of people tell me they're really relying on recaps. Benta Berkland, I, I want to come back to you um, in terms of how people are following this. Do you find folks have their minds made up or are they still open-minded, waiting for more information? What do they say about that? I think it's a little bit of both. Definitely you have the pro-Trump supporters who feel like this is just a waste of time and that the government should move on and people have been trying to get Trump out of office since the day he was elected. And some Democrats, they know how they feel. They think there's already enough evidence for impeachment. But I was surprised how many people are in the middle who were waiting to get more information. I talked to a conservative woman who did not vote for Trump in the last election. She voted third party. And she said how lawmakers conduct themselves during this 
public phase will impact her vote, especially down ticket. We have a very uh, competitive U.S. Senate race. Republican Cory Gardner is facing potentially a tough challenge, and she said that could impact how she votes in the Senate race uh, when it moves to that phase, if it does. So it was, uh, you know, not everyone is set in their opinions on this, and we found that with unaffiliated voters as well. And, and Mary LaHammer, what about uh, the Twin Cities? What about Minnesota? People uh, set in stone on this or still uh, looking for information? You know, I think there are some looking for information. Our latest poll, Survey USA and KSTP, came out with 45 percent of Minnesotans thinking there was enough evidence to convict, and 40 percent saying they're not. 15 percent either don't have an opinion or undecided. I talked to one independent voter today who said he is still watching, watching everything closely, watching as much of the hearings as possible to make up his mind. He said he's staying open-minded, really wants to hear. Then I checked in with another independent voter. We have a lot of them here. And that independent voter said they're at complete fatigue. They're done. They're not watching. They want to move on to issues. We are an issue-oriented populace here. And this voter wanted to hear about health care, cares a lot about health care. Mm. We have major employers. The world-famous Mayo Clinic here is the largest employer in the state of Minnesota. Many, many health care companies, a lot of Fortune 500 companies. We care about business. We care about health care. It sounds like some have really kind of started to reach a fatigue point on it. Katie Swatolsky, back to you uh, in South Florida. What about this question of across the board? Voters still open to new information, new facts are pretty much set in their views. I would say the voters I've spoken with are set in their views one way or the other. I think especially for Democrats keeping up with the impeachment hearings, a couple of voters told me, now we know that there's evidence. Now we see our evidence. Versus Republicans, um, I think a lot of Trump supporters I spoke with are really, really um, convinced that there's not evidence. So I think both sides are seeing what they want to see come from the impeachment proceedings. Um, but they're still paying attention, even though they're not necessarily coming across as open-minded. Benda Berklin, I want to come back to you on the question of, uh, are people believing uh, what they see and what they hear? Do they think the process is being, is being conducted in a fair way, that it's on the level? I think, well, it, that one was a little bit more partisan. I think Republicans feel like the whole question in and of itself has, is done in a partisan way and it shouldn't even be happening. And I think Democrats and more of the unaffiliated voters thought, look, this information has come to light and we need to get to the bottom of this. To echo of what Mary said, there is a sense of fatigue, even from Democrats who feel that the president should be impeached. They don't want this to drag on too long. People are just really worn out and weary. And a lot of folks, it's even hard to get them to talk about this topic. People said they try to keep their opinions to themselves because they know how volatile it can be and they know how divergent people's opinions are. So in, in some sense, people are really interested, but they also want to move on. Same thing, uh, Mary LaHammer, um, Minnesota. Do you find people believe what they're watching? Do they think this is a, this is a, a fair process? I think it really depends on where you come from. I think Democrats think it's fair, and I think Republicans don't. I've noticed, looking at just my email inbox from our members of Congress, because we have a really interesting delegation, we have a majority, five out of eight of our new members of Congress are new, and four of them flipped seats. So we had two Republicans who flipped Democratic districts, two Democrats who flipped Republican districts, and they're all relatively quiet. I don't even think our members of Congress really want to be talking oh. about this much. We even have an ad going now. We have our 7th District Congressman Colin Peterson. He is a Democrat who won in the biggest Trump district. So he is, has a really tough challenger in a battle with former Lieutenant Governor Michelle Fishbach running against him. And there are ads right now trying to drum on Colin Peterson about this. And he is one of only two Democrats who voted against the initial impeachment proceedings. So we are incredibly divided, and those five new members of Congress are under a lot of pressure on this issue. So when you add it all up, um, Katie Swatolsky, people feeling that we're going to get to the bottom of this? in some way, uh, or just they just are writing this off? Well, I had a couple of voters tell me, look, impeachment is going to happen one, you know, one way or the other, potentially. We don't know if that equals removal. Um, but it doesn't matter, because what's next is the election. So I think Democrats are really, really trying to look forward, figure out how to get out the vote, mobilize, organize ahead of the election, despite whatever happens with impeachment, keep moving towards the election.
So interesting to get these views from around the country. Uh, Katie Swatalski, Broward County, uh, Florida, WLRN Radio, Benta Brooklyn with Colorado Public Radio, and Mary LaHammer, uh, Twin Cities PBS. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judy. Thanks, Judy. Thanks. Black Friday, two days away, kicks off the peak of shopping season, and especially for Amazon. This year, the company is offering to deliver some packages to its Prime members in one day. In fact, the retail giant announced that it will hire 200,000 people for the holiday shopping season, double the number of workers it hired a year ago. But many Amazon staffers say the demand for greater speed is the leading factor harming warehouse workers. Like many other companies, Amazon does not make its workplace injury rates public. But Will Evans of Reveal from the Center for Investigative Reporting was able to compile injury records from Amazon work sites across the country for the first time and has some sobering findings. All right, guys, let's go ahead and clap it out, clap it out. It's the beginning of peak shopping season at Amazon. In a company video, this is how one manager revs up his workers. Two, three, ah! Amazon is gearing up for a huge spike in shipping. Last year, the online retailer says it sold 180 million items in the five days from Thanksgiving to Cyber Monday. The company boasts of the speed, which is the cornerstone of its business model. Have you ever wondered how Amazon gets your packages to you so quickly? The slam machine weighs, scans your box, and attaches a label all in like one second. Candace Dixon has experienced this push for speed firsthand, working at an Amazon fulfillment warehouse in Southern California. I've worked physical jobs, you know, and it seemed okay at the very beginning. Dixon worked as a stower, loading hundreds of products into storage bins, with a computer tracking her pace per package down to the second. It should take 11 seconds or less if you can, but 11 seconds was the goal. Is that hard to meet? Yeah. <laughs> if staffers don't meet their quota, they can get written up and fired. Dixon had to hit her rate no matter what package came her way. I had a full shift of all heavy items. That's what happened. I got injured. I pulled my back out. Her doctor told her to limit heavy lifting, but she says Amazon sent her back to work, still dealing with heavy boxes, and her injury got worse. She's now out of work. She received a workers' comp settlement, but that money is running out. Doing dishes hurts. Preparing my food hurts. And so I don't even know how I'm going to survive financially. Am I going to have a home in a couple months if I don't have an income? Probably not. So I don't. I don't know what to do. Amazon refused to let us film inside any of its warehouses, but in online videos, the nation's second largest private employer touts its culture of safety. Safety is always the number one priority. We want to be the most safety-centric organization in the world. Amazon, which is not unionized, closely guards records of serious injuries like Dixon's. But federal regulations say the company must provide workers with the injury logs from their work sites. So, with the help of Amazon employees around the country, we were able to obtain official injury records from 23 warehouses across 14 states, representing about 20% of Amazon's fulfillment centers. At these warehouses, we found that last year, workers got seriously injured at more than double the industry average. In some facilities, it's four or even six times that average. Serious injuries are those for which workers need to take time off or be restricted from certain tasks. Amazon declined to be interviewed, but in an email stated the rates are high because it diligently reports injuries, saying, Amazon encourages the reporting of every incident, regardless of how small. It also said that rates of lost work time are high because Amazon takes an abundance of caution in not placing employees back at work before they are ready. We showed our findings to a former Amazon safety manager who asked us to hide his identity. He said the injury rates at Dixon's warehouse were much higher than they should be. 422 recordable injuries. That's, that's a significant amount of injuries. That should not be happening. 
Overall, the injuries we found ranged from lacerations to concussions. Most were labeled strains and sprains. About a third of the injured workers had to take off more than a month to recover. We've looked at how we can get packages to the customer in a day, but we haven't figured out how we can get packages to the customer in a day without hurting people. He says the high injury rates are linked to the extreme production quotas that Amazon workers must hit every shift. Are they just going too fast? I think that's where it lands. It doesn't afford for what the toll on the body is. People might be making those numbers, but what are they sacrificing to make that number? This is the shirts that they gave everybody. Christina Van Voorst worked at the same warehouse as Dixon. And then this is the, the Million Unit Club. And that means you ship out a million units in a day. Yes. She saw the overwhelming pressure to get packages out the door as fast as possible, especially during peak shopping season. It's intense. It's very, very intense. Think of Santa's workshop. From the time you punch in to the time you punch out, you're like going a million miles a minute. In early January, Van Voorst was working the night shift when she and her coworkers smelled gas. Her manager told her to keep working, but she felt she had to call 911. Hi, I'm calling from um, Amazon building. I'm one of the associates here, and I believe that there is a gas leak here. Um, there was two associates that I know for sure that were vomiting. Um, one girl almost completely passed out. She said management wouldn't stop operations for fear of not meeting their quotas. I've already said something to them several times, like everyone's sick and you're not letting people go. Like they're trying to tell us we have to use our personal time if we want to leave. Okay. You know, they're worried about getting fired or losing their hours or losing their pay. And that's not something that they should be worried about when there's a gas leak. You should be worried about your life. Workers who left their shift that day were docked for personal time, though Amazon eventually reversed that after workers complained. When they sit there and say that all they care about is the safety of their employees, well, obviously not, because if they cared about the safety, of, if safety was first, then everybody would have been evacuated from that building, and they weren't. In its statement, Amazon refuted this, saying... Within minutes of being alerted to the smell of gas, all associates in the immediately affected area were removed. The site shut down for about one and a half hours. Associates are to remain on site so we can resume operations once the situation is resolved. But Van Voorst and three other workers told us there was no site-wide shutdown. Amazon says it is doing what it can to make warehouses safer for workers, like by adding more robots to the warehouse floors. We're constantly striving to be a leader. There's many things that we've actually changed in our operations through the use of technology that actually helps speed things up, but at the same time, it makes it safer for our associates to do. But in fact, we found that in our data, many of the highest injury rates were from warehouses with robots. The former Amazon safety manager saw this firsthand. If you go to the Amazon robotics sortable buildings, you're basically going into lion's den. There's more automation. There's more places for me to interact with a process where I can get hurt. And it's faster. It is. It's faster. The pace in that building is blistering. He says robots increase the pace to the point where humans just can't keep up. Have the robots basically push humans past their limits? I think you're seeing that nexus where we're like, man, humans are tapping out. He hopes that Amazon workers will not pay the price for even speedier deliveries this holiday shopping season. You know, when you order something from Amazon and you've worked inside Amazon, you wonder, like, hey, is it going to cause some sort of significant injury or illness or something like that? If I order, you know, one-click ship, what's the effect that it's going to have on somebody's life? This is Will Evans for Reveal and PBS NewsHour in Eastvale, California. On Friday, in the second of our series, Will investigates a death at an Amazon fulfillment warehouse that raises questions about how government officials deal with potential safety violations at the global company. Stay with us coming up on the news hour. The threat of rising water. An entire village in Alaska moves. 
For many of us, the Thanksgiving meal is one of the most beloved culinary traditions of the year. But that feast usually ends with plentiful leftovers and then some. That extra sum, so to speak, often ends up in the garbage and adds to the much larger problem of food waste in this country. That makes it a good time to look at the burgeoning movement to rethink our attitudes and approach about all of this. Special correspondent Allison Aubrey of NPR showed us the depth of the problem in previous reports, and she's back for a special series this week. Allison, welcome. Hi there. Good to be here, Judy. And it's good to have you back. So the numbers are staggering, something like 30 to 40 40 percent of the food we produce never makes it to the table. That's right. And when these numbers were first documented several years ago, the reaction was, how could this be? This is insane, right? Now, two years later, there are all kinds of solutions being tried all over the country. For instance, we visited farmers in Massachusetts. They are taking food waste, streams of food that can't be eaten, and turning it into electricity, into renewable energy. Now, we start the series in California. That's because the state is really leading the way. I traveled with producer Mary Beth Durkin around the state, and here's what we found. When we first came to Salinas Valley four years ago, we saw walls of leafy greens being tossed away, and it's still happening. On peak days, up to 200 tons of produce is headed to this dump. It's all surplus from nearby farms and packaging facilities. One reason these greens end up here is because they weren't shipped in time to give grocers enough shelf time to sell them. But it was these plastic bags that really frustrated Cesar Zanuga. He's the facility's waste manager. It's sad to receive all this material and not put it to a better use. Um, the plastic, it makes it hard to compost as well. If you shred the plastic with the organics, it contaminates the compost. All this used to be tossed in a landfill where it would rot and emit methane, a greenhouse gas. But Cesar Zanuga says there's a new solution. Look at all that lettuce, and it's all in plastic. Yeah, it's all film plastic. This is the same stuff we saw four years ago. Now we have this machine, the debagger, which separates that film plastic from the lettuce. All of that bagged lettuce goes in here. As you can see, it's being separated. The ah, plastic yes. is coming out here. And if you walk around the corner here, you'll see the organic materials coming out on this side into this container here. Whoa, look at that, it's like a slurry. We call it a salsa. Ah, so a salsa of wasted lettuce. So here's where you take all of that lettuce slurry and turn it into something more valuable? After we debag the material and get the slurry out of it, we will mix it with the material that's behind us and compost it. So you're turning it into compost and then selling it back to farmers. Yeah, we sell it back to the farmers and they place it back on the agricultural lands to grow more produce for us. So it's a real reuse, recycle. And composting can reduce or prevent the release of methane as these greens break down. This is beneficial because methane is a significant contributor to greenhouse gas emissions and a factor in climate change. In addition to composting, recovering edible food before it makes it to a landfill is another effective way to prevent food waste. In the coming year, California will roll out new regulations that require food businesses, like grocery stores and wholesale distributors, to donate their edible food waste. By 2022, if they don't comply, businesses could be fined. Right now, the easiest thing to do is to just throw whatever extra food you have out. So with this new law, it's forcing people to take that extra effort, and that exercise in itself helps people to reduce the amount of surplus they're creating. That's Dana Gunders, who helped put the issue of food waste on the map back in 2012 with a report that documented just how much goes to waste. The state of California is also expanding grants to nonprofits to recover all of this surplus food that may have just gone to waste in order to feed hungry people. Millions of pounds of produce a year. One group leading the way is called Food Forward. It's run by Rick Namias. Collecting food donations is nothing new, but what you see here is taking it to a whole new level. It's the quantity that's kind of amazing. We've got melons, kale, watermelons, corn in the back. It's like a supermarket. 
Thanks to a $500,000 grant from the state, Namias bought this warehouse, equipped with a refrigerator that can hold up to 150,000 pounds of produce. All of this will double the amount of food he can recover. People just don't understand the scale of overproduction. And there's no one in, let's say, you know, fruit and veggie land control tower figuring out exactly where the stuff should be going and coming from. So the result is waste. Okay. He's so out to change now. this. Food so Forwards developed a sophisticated system to match the wholesalers who have surplus food to give away uh, with the people who need it. And this year, they'll distribute food to 1,800 hunger relief agencies in Southern California. A lot of the surplus comes from farms, farmers markets, and right here, the L.A. wholesale food market. We woke up at 5 a.m. to check it out. Do you have any deals yet this morning? Yes, right now we just got offered eight pallets of peaches, 14 to 15,000 pounds. Whoa, of that's a lot. Yes. Louise Yepes is part of the Food Forward operation team, and his job is to nag vendors who are getting ready to toss stuff out. By 6 a.m., Yepes has recovered close to 80,000 pounds of produce. So why would any of these vendors be offering you donations? What's wrong with this produce? A lot of the produce that gets donated get donated mostly because there's minor imperfections. And that's not the only reason. They told me that it was this pallets over here, that pallet, this pallet, all these pallets right here. Wow, all going to go to waste. They haven't been sold yet, and they have a new shipment of peaches coming in, so they want to get rid of them before they have to throw them away. The issue with this particular boxes of peaches is that there is some decay. But and some of them are good, so you don't yeah. want to throw away the whole box. Unfortunately, this particular company is short on refrigerated space. They want to donate them. By 10 a.m., these peaches and all the other produce are loaded onto this truck. First stop, Resurrection Church in East L.A. Families are lined up waiting. Back at the wholesale market, I asked Yuppies if he's worried about not having enough food. There's definitely enough food in Los Angeles and in local food systems that we are definitely able to feed everyone in Southern California. The issue is not necessarily with the food being available, it's a distribution problem. Getting it to the people yes. in need. It's just a logistics problem. You gotta create the bridges between the abundance and the people in need. Picking up this afternoon. A logistics problem that Namias has a fix for. He's got new software to help track the enormous amounts of produce they're moving in and out. We're able to track food in real time. We're able to see where the trucks are at, what is on each truck, where it's coming from, where it's going, and it's allowed us to scale. And that scale is what's needed. California is not the only state taking action. Five states and five cities have restrictions aimed at diverting food waste from landfills. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Allison Aubrey of NPR News in Los Angeles. This week has brought another alarming milestone. Global greenhouse gas emissions hit a record level again last year. As those heat-trapping gases increase, the Earth warms, melting even the thick ice in the Arctic that's supposed to remain permanently frozen. As a result, rising seas could threaten hundreds of millions of people worldwide, including in a small Alaskan village. Stephanie Sai has the story of that village and its efforts to adapt. It's part of our series on the leading edge of science, health, and technology. More than two decades ago, the Yupik of Nootak, Alaska, voted to move to a new land. With the earth warming, the permafrost their village sat on was melting, while rising seas were making the Ninglik River rise and erode the river line and coastline, on average 70 feet a year. In early October, the first Yupiks started moving to their new town, Muttervik, located along a hillside of a volcanic island from where the Ninglik meets the Bering Sea. The new place is close, only nine miles away, but their journey was long and as relocation coordinator Romy Cariente describes, arduous. Getting all of the material, equipment, uh, people, food, everything that's associated with construction, the whole logistics, the whole planning of this move uh, was really challenging for everybody. 
Without a federal policy for relocating people affected by climate change, the UPIC sought various funding sources, and the military helped build some of the houses. The first prototype house was erected in 2016, and 17 families have now moved in to new abodes. They are improvements to what they and many other rural Alaskans have had, with proper running water and sewage, replacing the so-called honey buckets that made living in Newtok less than sanitary. The community collaborated with outside groups, including the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, to design and engineer a village that would continue their culture of subsistence living off the land. Cadiente says the fishing is better near Muttervik. The folks didn't want to get integrated into another village or move because they've been around this area for hundreds of years. They know uh, where to fish when the fish is running. They know where to hunt when it's that time of the year. So just keeping their subsistence livelihood intact together with their culture, we wanted to keep that alive for them. The houses are more sustainable, harnessing renewable energy. And with them, the UPIC enter a new future, one that they hope is healthier and safer. It's heartbreaking to see a home, um, you know, that is almost being lost to the river, just scared families that don't know or don't, you know, and then you keep their tradition, you keep their identity. Climate refugees, they've been called, but also survivors, and in a way, pioneers. The resettlement of the Yupik people has drawn in local, state, and federal agencies from different fields and is far from over. One of the organizations helping to manage the relocation effort is the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. Gavin Dixon is the community development manager for that group and joins me now from Anchorage. Gavin, you were in Matarvik recently. Give us an idea of how people are settling in. We've got about 18 families moved in out there uh, and people are settling into their new homes and, uh, you know, getting used to more space in a new location. And I think people are starting to embrace their new home. How long will it take to fully relocate and resettle the entire community from New Talk? It depends a little bit on when investment comes for additional housing and infrastructure in Muktavik, but uh, we're forecasting uh, by 2023 relocating the entire population of New Talk to the new site. There are communities around the country and the world, as you know, facing tough questions about whether to stay in flood prone areas or relocate. Where do you see the Yupik relocation model fitting into the national conversation? Well, I think uh, New Talk is a community that's moving early and doing it in advance of the impacts of erosion. They're not the only community in rural Alaska. There are many other communities, at least 12 other communities that are likely to face a either partial or full relocation due to the impacts of flooding and erosion, but there's a lot more people in this country and all over the world that face the same threats. And it's not easy to move, and it's not just the challenges from a personal level are very serious. Uh, the challenges from a technical uh, con design and construction level, especially in the Arctic and especially in rural Alaska, are very complicated. What other challenges came out of this process of relocation that would be informative to other communities facing the same fate with climate change approaching? I, I think uh, some of the decisions that have been the most challenging are, are how do you relocate? Um, and then, and how do you plan for something that happens slowly? Um, you know, a lot of times when a community faces a disaster, it's, a, it's an event, it's a tornado, it's a hurricane, it's an earthquake. And the effort to rebuild is based on that specific event. But what happens when it's a slow moving disaster like erosion or persistent flooding? Um, and how do you plan for addressing a disaster like that? And so New Talk has put a lot of effort into planning on a long time scale what it's like to relocate the community, how they do it, what's the highest priority. How much uh, did the people, the Yupik people, contribute to building this new community? An incredible amount. More than half the construction crew has been uh, a local workforce out there. The community has also put every dollar that they can, they can scrounge from every funding source they can imagine, including their own 
uh, tribally generated revenues into building more housing for their people. How much time do the folks that are still in New Talk have to relocate uh, before their homes disappear into the sea? In 2019, seven homes uh, would have gone into the Ninglick River if they had not been demolished in advance of the advancing erosion. Those homes, those residents have already relocated to the new site, but more homes lie in the way of the erosion that's encroaching at about 60 feet a year. The folks closest to the erosion have less time than others. We expect there's about four houses that could be potentially impacted in 2020. We expect that the school, which is really a central pillar of the community, will be impacted as soon as 2021 or 2022. And, and the airport, uh, which is the community's primary uh, transportation access, would be impacted by 2023. One of the core tenets of the culture in New Talk is adaptability. And I think that's a really important value that their community and their culture maintains to deal with a threat like climate change, uh, a changing environment. Gavin Dixon, the community development manager with the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. Gavin, thank you so much. Thank you. Tonight's Brief But Spectacular features performer Adrienne C. Moore, an actress best known for her role in Orange is the New Black. She opens up here about pulling characters from her upbringing in Atlanta and the impact her father had on her. This is part of Canvas, our continuing covering of arts and culture. What I love about acting and being in front of people is honestly seeing their expressions. My first production that I can remember was the best Christmas pageant ever in Nashville, Tennessee. I had no lines, just the little chorus parts, but that gave me a chance to look at every single person in the audience during the show and seeing them smile and laugh and have, have feelings and emotions. And from that moment on, I said, I want to do this for the rest of my life. Orange is the New Black came about just like any other audition. They called me in for Black Cindy. Immediately when I read it, I said, oh my gosh, I know this girl. To me, she represented a lot of girls that I had run across when I'd moved to Atlanta, just very fiery and speak their minds and, you know, pop their fingers and roll their eyes and roll their heads and just tell their truth. And so when I read her, I said, I I think I could embody her. Of course she ain't smiling. She got screwed by me, by, by everybody. Suzanne, everything is broken and life is unfair. When are you gonna learn that? The play that I did in Shakespeare in the Park was called Taming of the Shrew. I got to work with Phyllida Lloyd, who is a phenomenal director. And I was always afraid of Shakespeare. Iambic pentameter and just going up on a line and all that kind of stuff, but she really taught me how to own the language and in that ownership, how to own the character. And once I got past that fear, I had the most amazing time. What was so revolutionary about that experience was that I lost my dad literally in the same time that I was doing that show. And so I was experiencing incredible highs and incredible lows at the same time. But one of the things that my dad taught me and told me before he passed was happiness. And so that's the thing that I always try to embody in my work and in my life and in, in who I am. I feel like when I'm in the pocket with something, I'll sometimes hear this little chime or this little ding somewhere off in the distance and I feel like it's my dad being like, you got it, you on the point, girl. My dad was very proud of me, of his children. Because one of the things he always said was, do what makes you happy. And a lot of times when I get in very confusing places in my life and I don't know what choice to make, I always think about what he said, which is do what makes you happy. And so that's how I make my decisions. I don't question, I just go inside of myself and I say, well, what will make me happy in this moment? Because that's what my dad taught me. My name is Adrienne Seymour. And this is my brief but spectacular take on all the characters of my life. And you can watch additional brief but spectacular episodes on our website, pbs.org newshour brief. 
Tonight, the NewsHour has a special report airing on PBS, The Plastic Problem. Our NewsHour reporting team spent more than a year examining how our global dependence on plastic has created one of the biggest environmental threats to our planet. Amna Nawaz hosts the program, and here's a quick look. The oceans are swimming in it. Rivers are choked with it. Coastlines are collecting it. Landfills are clogged with it. Our trash bags are filled with it. And it's even floating in the air we breathe. Imagine spreading out 9 billion metric tons evenly. We could cover an area the size of Argentina or California six times over. It's plastic, the material we can't seem to live without that also lasts longer than a lifetime. Plastic can take hundreds of years to break down, and even then, only into microparticles. It's hurting animals. It's in our food chain. Plastic is everywhere. The Plastic Problem airs on PBS tonight at 10 and at 9 Central. And that's the news hour for tonight. I'm Judy Woodruff. Join us online and again here tomorrow evening for all of us at the PBS News Hour. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Major funding for the PBS News Hour has been provided by Consumer Cellular offers no contract wireless plans that are designed to help you do more of the things you enjoy. Whether you're a talker, texter, browser, photographer, or a bit of everything, our U.S. based customer service team is here to find a plan that fits you. To learn more, go to consumercellular.tv. BNSF Railway. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. This is PBS News Hour West. From WETA Studios in Washington and from our bureau at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University.